Romans chapter 1. I thought throughout this week, this is a very hard passage to talk about. It uh, shows you the depth of mankind as they continue their spiral away from God. And it's kind of hard to really go into enough deep detail for you to understand it, but at the same time not go into so much detail that um, it becomes boring or becomes laborious. There's so much stuff to deal with here, but I'm going to try to present it in a way that you understand what is being said and can also see how it goes in our culture. If we read through, and I'll read through as we go through, the uh, description, sad to say, kind of fits our culture rather to a T, I guess I would say. And we'll see what we can learn from that accordingly. Remember, Romans 1 to 3 talks about the need of salvation. And the need of salvation is sin. Men are sinners, and they need a Savior. And really in chapter 1, he's talking about the sinfulness of the Gentile world as opposed to the Jewish world, which he deals with in chapter 2. And then chapter 3, he sums it all up to say, all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. It makes no difference where you're a Jew, a Gentile, whether you have the law of God or not. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Every person is unrighteous. There is none righteous, no, not one. So he's going to lay down the basic groundwork of the reality of sinfulness and before he gets to discuss in chapter 4 the solution to that need. And of course, that's the Savior of Jesus Christ. And so as we get ready to go into the scriptures here, I want to have a word of prayer first, and then we'll dive in and see just what we're able to learn tonight. Father, we thank you for the word of God as it is, Lord. It doesn't call pulling the punches. It tells us exactly the truth of the matter. Every other religion talks about how man is basically good, but the word of God is very clear. We are sinners, and we can tell that, but Lord, by just watching the world around us and watching each other, looking at our own lives and how we have lived as well at different times. We know sin is real, it's there, it's powerful, and it has man in its grip, and as man continues to drift away from you, it becomes more and more evident in this lifestyle as you show here in the scriptures. Just remind us of what is going on, Lord, to challenge our hearts, to realize again how important it is for us to shine your light in this dark world of ours, because Jesus is the only hope they have, and we're thankful we have that hope, and may the hope be real in our life and real to everyone that we see. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. There's a Princeton scripture called, Whatever You Sow, You Shall Reap, and that's kind of like what happens in this chapter. I read a story about a farmer who was renting a farm. Actually, he didn't own it, but he rented it for many years. He worked hard on it, had good crops. Things were going very, very well. Um, but then came a time when the agent who leased the land to him said, um, I hate to tell you this, but in your lease, you're going to have to leave because the owner, owner, his son's getting married and he wants to have the farm, so your time here is over. Which, of course, one of those things you probably knew was going to come eventually, but at the same time, all his hard work is going to be given over to somebody else and the farm would be like that. And the more he thought about it, the more angry he became, the more resentful, the more bitter and uh, so about a couple weeks beforehand, he decided he's going to get his revenge. So he went out and bought some of the seeds of weeds and everything else he could find that he knew once they started growing would destroy all the crops that he had laid. That way, at least the son wouldn't get the crops he worked so hard for. So he went out and just did it all. Felt pretty good about it too, he said. And then about uh, two weeks before the lease came up, the agent came to the farmer and said, I got good news for you. The owner Son is not going to get married after all, so you can stay on the farm and enjoy yourself. <laughs> Agent was shocked when the uh, farmer was angry and said, what a fool I am. Because now he had sowed and is going to reap what he sowed, not as he had planned to do so. But that is a fact of scripture. It's a fact of life. We reap what we sow. And Paul has been talking in chapter 1, this review, about how God has unveiled himself to mankind through the created world so man can look and see and come to the conclusion there is a God and that this God is powerful, he is wise, he is intelligent, he is loving, he is merciful, he is just. They can conclude that from the round and round, but, but they've decided not to give glory to God. We saw the first step was an ingratitude. They said, we're not going to give God thanks. We're not going to give God the glory. We're not going to give him praise. And instead, we're going to turn something other. So if the God's not the one that's behind all this, then we have to invent something else. And that is what they did. And so that leads, we saw, to gratitude and pushes us away from God and eventually leads to idolatry, where a man chooses to worship something other than God because 
they have no choice, even though it's worshiping themselves as man. And that's the step they have taken. They profess themselves to be wise. They became fools. And then verse 24 goes, wherefore, that is because man has decided, in chapter 1, verse 24, because man has decided that we're not going to give glory to God and we're going to run away from God and we're not going to even pay attention to God, then God says, okay, then this is what's going to happen. And in verse 24 and in verse 26, and in verse uh, 28, we have a similar phrase. God gave them up in verse 24. God gave them up in verse 26. God gave them over. Although, to be honest with you, it's just one word in the Greek language. It's the same exact word. So three times God says, okay, I'm going to hand you over into a certain direction of your life. Basically what God is saying is, you want to live a life without me. You think that living a life without me is going to bring you joy and peace and happiness? Well, I tell you what, I'm going to let you reap what you have sowed. If that's what you want to do, go right ahead and see what happens to you. That's what he basically doing. He says, I'll just let you go. I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to force you to worship me. I'm not going to force you to have the kind of life I created you to have. If you don't want me, then I'm just going to let you go and do what you want to do and see what you get out of it. It's not going to be a whole lot different than what Solomon did in Ecclesiastes. He said, let us suppose we ignore God or there is no God. How can we find life and meaning in life? Let's go for it and see what happens. And that's what God's saying. I'm just going to, okay, fine. That's what you want to live. That's your philosophy of life. Then this is what you can do and you can go ahead and deal with it. And since there's three things, there are three ways we're going to sit there and see. The first one in verse 24 and 25 it deals with the fact he'll give men up to and insatiable desires, yearnings, yearnings to be, desires to do right, but they never satisfied. They can never really meet the needs within their hearts. They, they tried their best, but nothing, nothing satisfied because they're doing it in a way that does not honor God. Wherefore, verse 24, chapter 1, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Uncleanness is a key term. Of course, it's the opposite of cleanness. Cleanness is a ceremonial rightness with God. You're right with God. There's a purity about you. So you're able to, to be with God and know God and walk with God and just enjoy all of the blessings he has for us and possess the life he wants us to have. Uncleanness has what we call the Nedica particle tax and denies everything of the word. So God gave them up then to a lifestyle that was the opposite of walking with him. A lifestyle of self-centeredness. A lifestyle that, that led them to focus upon the desires of their own hearts. You see, it, it's through or, or towards the lust of their own hearts. The lust of strong desires. They're not necessarily evil in and of themselves, but, but if you let people just go and do what you want to do, and they're sinners, then we know what's going to happen. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, Jeremiah says. And therefore, if that's what they're going to follow, and they're going to say, this is what I want to do, then they're going to pursue the satisfy the desires, but as they pursue to satisfy them, they're never going to be satisfied. That's why they have to do more and more and more, and do everything you can, because nothing works. It, that's what's going to happen to them. He says, that's the way they go, and they begin to live. And what do they do? They dishonor their body between themselves. Dishonor means they treat as something that's valueless, no respect. They don't treat their bodies with any respect, any way, shape, or form. And I think it's pretty clear when you look at other scriptures, what he's talking about is the concept of immorality, which is another principle, I think. Idolatry almost always results in immorality. It's just one of those things that begin to happen. We choose not to follow God, and we choose to follow ourselves. then the end result is we choose to satisfy the desires of our heart, and that ends up and an immoral behavior of life. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, he says, Flee fornication, which means all kinds of sexual morality. Every sin that a man do doeth is without the body. He that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. That is, God has established the sexual relation between a man and a woman to be a pure and wonderful, wonderful experience, but it's always connected within the bond of commitment to each other. And he says, when that's taken out of that commitment, it becomes nothing more than a physical activity that is done, and that's not how God designed it to be done. 
And he, Paul's actually saying that, that when a person engages in morality, um, they're actually denying everything that God said about this wonderful act, and it becomes nothing that involves the whole person, which is the whole process of it, because that's when we give ourselves fully to one another in the act of marriage. He says it just becomes nothing more than the physical activity you do, and it never satisfies you, because it never satisfies the entire being of your life, spiritual, emotional, intellectual. It's just an act of thing. You know, that's, that's what we have seen happen. I mean, it happened back in the 50s and 60s with Mr. Hefner and the Playboy philosophy. He devalued the whole concept of this relationship and made it nothing more than the physical activity and the world bought into it. And Paul says that's what's going to happen. There's no respect for what I serve to the bodies. They dishonor the bodies. And he says the reason to do it, again, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. What was the lie? That man knows better about life than God does and that we can do better by forgetting God and doing what we want to do. He says they ignored it. They served. The word served there is a spiritual ministry. They served and ministered to the creature rather than the creator. They turned away from God, and the end result is a lifestyle that will never be satisfied every way, shape, or form. That's America today. In 2014, 2015, excuse me, May, an article survey said 81% of Americans see a decline in morality in America. That's six years ago. Probably worse today. Back in April 14, 2014, a guy named Michael Snyder I saw, he wrote an article, 100 facts about the moral collapse of America that are too crazy to believe. I'm not giving all of them, but here's some of them that just make you think a little bit about where we are today in our world. 30% of all internet traffic goes to adult websites. It is estimated that 89% of all pornography is produced in the United States of America. More than half of all couples now move in together before they get married. America has the highest percentage of one-person households in the world. If you want to see why there's so much problem out there in the violent world, it's because of the home life. No one wants to talk about that, but that's the bottom line. When most of us were raised with the church, almost all of our friends had a mom and a dad at home. And when you went home, you made sure they did your homework, they sat with you, helped you out. Today, more often than not, the child has one parent at home and may not even know who dad or mom even is. It's sad, but this is what happens. This is where we are in America today. It's a world that is filled with immorality. It's been doing that for a long time. One article put it this way. We see immorality normalized in the entertainment industry and society at large. We see dishonesty and lack of integrity normalized among our business people and politicians. We see lies and distortions of the truth as an everyday element in reporting by our news media. And we see those educating their children, basing their teaching, a belief system that promotes the, exception, the acceptance of all of these things. And it's true. In fact, I think over the last few months, it's gotten worse than I've ever seen it in my life in America, where you have the President of the United States telling an outright lie. So bad that Washington Post gave him four Pinocchios for it saying it's completely, totally false. What he, and yet he continues to repeat it and never apologize for it yet at all. You're going, how can that be? How can, how can? And, and that's what we see over and over again. Children see all this stuff. Young people see all this stuff. And what do they think? Why bother to tell the truth? No one knows any truth anymore. That's just the process. And it goes on and on and on. Unsatiable desires dominate the life of people that go astray from God. And then there's a, goes on further, he says, wherefore, in verse 26, for this cause, meaning as they've already moved in that direction, God gave them up unto vile affections. Even the women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men work in that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves the recompense of the error which was meat. Vile affection, vile is the same thing, dishonoring, same word. In other words, this is what I would call an, an unholy passion, because affections means a passion. God says, okay, you want to pursue a, a lifestyle of immorality. He says, after that's done and you find it doesn't satisfy you, then they move in a wholly, completely different direction. And of course, what is being said is very clear. Do they leave in the natural use, which is man with a woman, to become men with men and women with women? He said, that's, that's, that's what's going to happen. That's life. Now, we're not the only nation that has seen this. This is rampant in the Roman Empire. It's not like there's anything that was new about 
homosexuality or whatever. It's been around for a long, long time. What's new here in America is that it has become acceptable and normal today. That's where the danger lies. That's where the problem is. I mean, you know, a few years ago, there was a lot of discussion about the homosexual movement. And then that kind of was forgotten for the concept of um, same-sex relationships and marriages. Now, that's normal. I mean, listen, listen to some of this stuff. One survey I saw in 2002, 38 percent of Americans believe that same-sex relationships are morally acceptable. Today, in 2018, 67 percent say it is acceptable. That's a major increase. And it's probably higher today, probably close to like 75 to 80 percent today. A Gallup poll, similar results. 60 percent of Americans believe that marriage between same-sex couples should be legally recognized with only 37 cents opposed. In fact, I don't even hardly hear about it anymore in the culture. It has become so predominant, it's just normal. It's just the way it is. And if you dare to stand up against it, you are just simply wrong. And what's the big issue dominating our news today? Transgenderism. People identifying as another and, and you know, I mean, there's even talk about, you know, allowing guys who identify as girls to compete in athletic events, which is totally absurd. Because I guarantee you, a man running a 100-meter race is going to be any woman, no matter how fast she is. It's just a way of life. This is God made us that way. And yet, there, there are people actually, I even saw an article today that said, some athlete came up and said, if you oppose transgender in the sports, you're, you're a white supremacist. It's like, I don't know how that has to do with anything, but that's what they say. I mean, listen to what's going on in our world of today. One source said back in 2019, a couple of years ago, 62% say they have become more supportive to transgender rights. In 2014, it was just 25%. So 25% in 2014, five years later, 62% say it's acceptable. That's so far we've gone already. One article says this, today in America, tells children their sex can change based upon their feelings, and society will honor those feelings even if biology says otherwise. Additionally, healthcare professionals, Hollywood elites, toy manufacturers, cookie makers are encouraging children to embrace transgenderism. Same article goes on to say, as recently as 2015, Dr. Paul McHugh, the former psychiatrist and chief for John Hopkins Hospital, classified transgenderism as a mental disorder. Okay, hear that? 2015. He classified it as a mental disorder and declared that changing one's sex is biologically impossible. In 2019, the World Health Organization voted that transgenderism or gender incongruence is no longer a mental disorder and is reclassified as a part of sexual health. And the rest of the medical community has joined in and said, we agree. That's where we live today. It's a fact of life. It's accepted. It's normal. And if you stand against it, you're abnormal. Something was strong and strange about you. You are labeled as a white supremacist or racist, one of the two, which seems to be the only terms that people have to say if you disagree with anybody. Well, that's exactly what God said would happen. As man goes away from God, give thanks to, doesn't give thanks to God, moves into immorality, idolatry, immorality, to get to this point where they just have an unholy passion and it dominates their entire life. That's what we see happening. Then there's a third one, he says, in verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their own knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Verse 28 to 32 is what I would call an unsatisfied lifestyle, an empty lifestyle of philosophy. It doesn't work. It doesn't do anything good. They think that they have arrived at the place where life is going to really be great. And unfortunately, it is life of nothing but emptiness, sorrow, and woe over and over again. God, God gave them up. He said, I'm just going to let you keep running, going the way you want to go. It's fine with me. They don't want to retain God. That is the, the knowledge. They, they, they know what it is. They understand God, but they've chosen to push God out of their minds. And God said, okay, I'm going to give you up. A reprobate mind means that a mind that has no reality attached to it. It's interesting, isn't it? Man thinks to really understand life. God says, you don't understand life at all. You know, it's like life is those reality shows we see in TV. Because those reality shows on TV are not reality shows. You understand that, don't you? I mean, if you ever watched after, what, 30 seasons of Survivor, you just watch the show, you realize, okay, 
this can't be happening live because they have like four different camera angles at the same couple at the same time. I'm going, okay, there's, okay, they show one angle here and there's no camera there. Next to the camera is the camera there looking this way. I'm saying, well, wait, they can't do that. How can they do that? You know, it's like in a regular sitcom, they do the same thing because they do the same thing over and over and over again with different camera angles. So I said, they do the same thing. This is not a reality. I said, I have no doubt in mind. The guy said, cut, cut, cut. That wasn't enough emotion. Let's try it again, people, you know. Now, I'm sure they did that kind of stuff. It's not, it's, it, but they call it reality. It's not reality. In fact, some of them, if you're watching those shows, you're thinking, where did they find these people? I've never been people like this in my entire life, you know. Don't know who they are. They're not normal people at all. But they claim it to be reality. And sad to say, they're actual people who think that's true. And so man says, this is reality. This is how life is. And God says, your whole mind is unreal. You don't even know what reality is. You don't understand what life is at all. Your whole philosophy is completely wrong. Do the things that are not convenient. That is, you're doing those things that do not fit why you have been created. God created us for a reason. That reason was to know him, to walk with him, to worship him, to enjoy him, to be blessed by his life. He created us to have a life filled with joy, hope, and peace that's connected relation with him. And man says, I don't want that kind of life. So he says, you're going to have a philosophy then that will give you nothing that you're looking for because your life will not fit what you've been created to do. Instead, he says, this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to be filled, and he lists a long lot of things in verse 20 and the following. Filled means up to the brim, complete and total in your life. And I think the first word, unrighteousness, is kind of like a general term that explains all the terms that follow in verse 29. Unrighteousness speaks of a life that's right with God. Righteousness means a life right with God, and thus a life that lives right for God. If I'm righteous, it means I'm right with God, and then that dictates that I live right for God. Unrighteousness means the opposite. I don't live right with God. I don't have a relationship with God, and therefore I live a relationship that I want to live, not what God wants me to live. He said, that's where man is. They want to live their life their way, and he said, this is what's going to be the result. And I sat down and I thought through all these things and trying to define them all. I'm going to put them under four classifications, four philosophies of life that are empty and mean nothing but dominate our culture today. Um, the, the first one he talks about is, I want everything. I want it all. That's what he says, I want it all. What are you going to have? He says, you're filled with unrighteousness. What stuff? Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. Those all speak about a desire within the heart to get whatever I want and to fulfill my desires as best as I can. Fornication means all and every kind of sexual immorality. Wickedness speaks of a, a desire to gain something that I don't have. Covetousness means I want more and more. I'm never satisfied with what I have. I've got to have more over and over again. Maliciousness has the same idea, but you, you try to get what you can through an incongruent and dishonest means. Full of envy means that I look at somebody else, I see what they have, I want what they have. If it means I destroy them to get it, that's what, exactly what I'm going to do. Isn't that what we see in our culture today? Those who are wealthy, those who are rich, who worked hard to get to that point, how are they looked upon culture? Do we look and say, I've got to follow their example? No, no, they're vilified. We've got to take what they've got. Get rid of it. Give it to those who don't have anything. That's, that's what the world says. That's, that's the mentality. I want it all. And, and that's, that's what dominates the whole culture. And, and then it goes on any further. Not only do I want it all, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get it all. I don't care what it's going to do. I'm going to do everything I can. Look what he says. Murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, and backbiters. All of those terms speak of the same emphasis. I'm willing to do whatever it's going to take to achieve my goals. Murder, we know what murder is. It's exactly what it means to take into a human life. I'm going to do that no matter what it takes. It doesn't bother me. I'm going to carry out that emphasis. Debate means uh, the concept of seeking to have a fight. It doesn't mean debate as we have two people debating an idea. It means strife, contention. I just want to battle. I want to fight. I'm doing whatever it's going to take to get there and take care of it in my life. Uh, deceit is similar. I'm going to get to what I want. How? By tricking people. Making them think one thing. In reality, I get to something other than, than what it might be in life. Malignity means a deep desire to hurt somebody just for the sake of doing it. Whispers and backfires is an interesting term. They both mean the same thing. 
saying something that's painful to somebody else, saying something to destroy somebody else. Here's the difference between those two words. Whisperers is a good translation because it means talking about someone behind their back quietly so no one knows about it. It's privately. You know, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? A backbiter does the same thing, but he, they do it in public. They don't care where everybody knows about it or not. They're going to lay it on the line. What do we call it? Twitter today, Instagram, lay it on the line, just put it out there. They try to delete it. I haven't the slightest idea why politicians and, and want to be on Twitter because as soon as you put anything on Twitter, everybody sees it and everybody knows about it and it goes everywhere and anywhere. And you can get in a lot of trouble. A lot of people got in tons of trouble doing that kind of stuff. Because it's like they're thinking that if I tell my friend one to one, it doesn't go anywhere. They're thinking the same thing with you on Twitter. You know, it's just going to stay quiet. No, it doesn't. It explodes everywhere. But that's our culture today. I'm going to give what I want. I'm going to do whatever it's going to take to get there. If you're in my way, tough. Because I would just bow you right over and get accomplished what I want to get accomplished. That's what we see in our culture today. I want to do all it. I'm going to do everything I can. And then you have this emphasis about, I know what's best for me. So God doesn't know. I know what's best for me. Look what he says. You're going to be haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Haters of God. They don't want anything to do with God. Despiteful, bitterness, proud boasters, all speak of the same thing. They are arrogant. They think that they know better than anybody else. And if you disagree with them, then they will shut you down and push you away because you obviously don't know what you're talking about. They're individuals who are inventors of evil. That is, they try to invent ways to try to quiet people and silence people. The concept of disobedient parents covers the same idea. I don't need mom and dad to tell me what to do because they don't know what they're talking about. I know much better than mom and dad do, which is typical for all teenagers probably. But as they get older, they figure it all out. But he's talking about this regular culture of people that simply say, basically, anyone in authority has no idea how to live. I know better how to do my life than anybody else. And again, we see that in our culture, do we not? Prevalent everywhere. So it is, continues. I want it all. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get it all. I know better than anybody else. And here's the last one. I don't care about anybody but me. I care about nobody but myself. Look what he says. Verse 31, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and unmerciful. Without understanding means they have no clue about how life works. Covenant breakers mean what it means. An individual that breaks his word over and over again, it means absolutely nothing. To agree to something and sign a document means nothing. Just break it. I don't care. If it's not going to work for me, forget it. You sue me, go ahead and sue me if you want. I don't care. I used to work for a guy, a Hatcon Recon Center up in Pennsylvania, and it was one of the places where the owner would buy cars in an auction, bring them to his lot, and then they would fix them up, and then he would sell them on his car lot. And, and he hired a guy to hire security guards. And he hired us, a lot of guys in seminary, because we could, were allowed to study. So I worked from um, the midnight shift, I think it was 11 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the morning, Friday night, and then I came back from 4 to 12 on Saturday evening. And I could work, I could study. So in the, in the evening hours, even at 2 a.m., um, you know, no one's around, I could, I could do my work. Not easy to do that, but unless I did it anyway, because that's what we like to do. And I remember the guy I worked for, he would tell me, he said, you know, this guy who owns this stuff, he's just a real pain. I said, what do you mean? He said, we made an agreement that he would pay me this much money so I could pay you guys. And when it comes time for him to pay, he refuses to pay me. He says, take me to court. Then he says, however, if you don't want to take me to court, why don't you pay me this much money instead? And he says, he knows that if I take him to court, it's going to cost me more money than what I'm going to settle for. So I just end up settling for yet. He said, that's how he does his whole life in business. He makes an agreement. I'll pay you $50,000. When it comes time for due, he says, I'm not going to pay you. Sue me. I'll tell you what, though. You pay me forty. dollars I won't. I'll, I'll, I'll let it be. So you settle for forty, dollars even though that's not what the agreement was. That's a covenant breaker. I'm not going to keep my word for you. I'm, not, I'm going to do what's best for me. That's all I care about, because that's all I'm better than anybody else. Without natural affection, what does that mean? That means we don't see in culture people who have the love of a mom and dad. They don't have a natural affection for family. Self is everything. Someone links this with abortion, because abortion perhaps is the epitome of that. A woman becomes pregnant with a child, and what, instead of loving that child and wanting to see it, they abort the child. Why? 97% of the reasons is because it's inconvenient for me to have a child. That's, that's, all, that's the facts of life. That's where we see it. That's where we are today. 
He goes on and says, uh, implacable. That means uh, a desire to be stubborn and, and just do what I want to do no matter what happens. And merciful means I don't care about anybody else. If they're getting hurt, it's not my problem. I'm going to do what's best for me. That's the culture where we live in today. And Paul goes on to summarize in verse 32. All of these individuals, they know the judgment of God. A knowledge meaning a knowledge is clear and understandable. They know without a doubt a judgment day is going to come one day. I believe God has put within the heart of every individual, I don't care how wicked and sinful they are, and deep inside they know that when they die, judgment is coming. They know that. And one reason I know that is because I have been with a lot of people who, when they're healthy and well, they want nothing to do with God. But when they're dying, life is totally different. Because now they realize, I may not make it. And if I don't do something now, I don't, I'm not ready to meet God. And I'm thankful that they're trying to get their life right, but it's kind of like sad they're doing it at the last second. That's not how God wanted it. But that does happen sometimes. But why did they do that for? Because they realize, deep inside, we know it's going to happen. It's going to be there. But he says, notice what he said, even though they have that knowledge, they which commit such things are worthy of that. That is, they understand that if we practice these kind of behaviors in sinful life and live according to their sinful, selfish heart, we are worthy of death. In other words, we don't have to really tell people that the wages of sin is death because they already know that. Deep inside, they understand that fact. Now, they clouded it over, they ignored it, they pushed it aside, thinking that we're good enough and we're nice enough, we'll make it to heaven. But deep inside, they understand the concept. He says, even though they have that knowledge, not only do they keep doing the same, the word do is present tense, not only do they always keep practicing the same stuff, they take pleasure in them that do them. Not only do they live that kind of lifestyle of rebellion against God, they encourage others to do it. When they do it, they all rejoice together and say, what a wonderful people we are. We're living our life, we're doing our dream, we're being everything we want to be, and God weeps in heaven and says, you don't know what life is like at all, because you're so far from me, you don't even know what life is. One commentator said this, Paul's purpose in writing this chapter was to show man's wickedness is so great that only God can rescue him. And I would agree. It's not a pretty picture to read Romans 1, all right? It's very painful to read through that. Very sad. And when you look upon our culture in America to see a nation where I was born and raised, and I'm old enough to know what America was like as a moral, decent community where Hollywood and media and the politicians and education and the home and the church all said the same exact message. I don't know how it was in Jacksonville, but I know in my high school, we had prayer over the intercom in high school. We had Bible club in, on, high, on school property during school hours. We had a dress code that puts most private schools to shame today. I remember the principal, you know, if my hair touched the back of my collar, he, of course, it never happened to me. I would never do that. But nonetheless, if it did, he would give me two choices. Go get a haircut or I'll cut his hair. He was a Marine. You know what that meant. I remember the dean of women. She was standing outside the gates of St. Petersburg High School. She had a ruler. And if you came as a young lady and your dress, you couldn't wear anything but dresses, only dresses. If your dress was two inches above your knee, you had to go home and get changed. Boom. For a regular day of school, that's how it was. They abolished the dress code when I was a senior. I found it interesting that hardly anyone changed who was a senior. We always wore the same clothes anyway. The only thing guys wanted to do for some stupid reason was they were happy they didn't have to wear socks. I have no idea why they did that. First thing they said, oh, we don't have to wear socks. I'm going, really? That's your excitement? And of course, they didn't wear socks for a week. You know what? They put them back on because they had blisters on their feet. <laughs> there's a reason why there's a dress code, people, okay? People know what they're doing. But today, Hollywood, politicians, education, and even some churches are opposed to God and his truth. And our younger generation have been trained and taught to forget God and have nothing to do with God whatsoever. Get rid of the Ten Commandments, get rid of the Bible, get rid of the prayer, get rid of all of it. And in this place, they have taught a philosophy that is right out of this chapter one. That's what we see today. We have reaping what has been sowed for the last 30 years in America. But at the same time, I don't want to end with a very depressing note. Because here's the good news, okay? There is a way out. 
there is a way to deal with sin. There is a way to remove the sin from the heart and to change a person from an immoral, idolatrous individual to a genuine, sincere follower of Jesus Christ. He's the answer to it all. And the good news is we have found that answer in Jesus Christ. And the good news is we're here. Why? To shine a light into this dark world. So people out there, even though they just don't seem to understand it, our light says to them that there is a real life that's different. That what you're doing and experiencing is nothing compared to what I have. I have joy, I have peace, I have hope, I have a Savior with me, I have a promises that undergird me every step of the way, a principle that guide me every step of the way. And you know, I go through difficulties and hardships, I don't worry and complain because I have him with me every step of the way. And hopefully somehow, some way, they watch us, they realize, you've got something I don't have, and I want it. That's the good news. We're here. We've got to strive. To, this chapter should motivate us to be faithful to God in every way we can and live faithfully for him and shine his light as much as we can. Because there's so much darkness out there today. And you'd be surprised what God can do. I read a story by Charles Spurgeon, great preacher. He was asked to go visit an elderly woman who was dying. And uh, he had the impression that she was dying and she didn't know Jesus Christ. So he went there with the goal of sharing the gospel with her to hopefully get her saved before she died. When he got there, he was surprised to find her rejoicing that she knew Jesus and she was looking forward to going home to be with him. He was kind of stunned because it was like, that's not what I was told. I'm glad. And he said, how did you get saved? He said, you know, I, I just want to know. This is what she told him. She said, I got saved reading this. She pointed to a piece of paper. He looked it up. It was a paper that was part of an American newspaper that had published a sermon that an American preacher preached in London, England, which is where he was with this woman. And someone in Australia had somehow gotten hold of that paper, and they sent a gift to this woman, and they wrapped the gift in the piece of paper. And when she got it, she opened the paper, and then she noticed in the paper and read the sermon, and the sermon opened her heart to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Imagine that. Somebody preached a sermon in London, England, and that sermon was reprinted in an American newspaper, somehow made it to Australia, and made it to this woman in London again, and that's what led her to Christ. I'm sure that preacher who preached the sermon in London never understood and knew that ever happened, but his words somehow, miraculously, went around the world to this woman, and there she is rejoicing that soon she's going to see Jesus face to face. That, I, lo I saw it and said, man, it tells what God can do through us. We have no idea, do we? I mean, can you imagine that? You may give out a track here, say a simple word here and there, and 10 years from now, you may hear someone come and say, that touched my heart and brought me to Christ. We may not even know that till we get to glory. I like that song, Thank You Says. You know, people come up and say, hey, hey, you don't know me, but this is what God did through you. So don't get discouraged after chapter one. Be encouraged because we're here with the answer and we should pray that God does everything he can in our life to show the answer to the world that needs it so desperately. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the gospel and what it means to us. We know we have a difficult world, but the world's not lost. You're still here, and as long as you're here and we're here in the power of God, we have the opportunity to reach people for you. Give us that burden and desire to get it done, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.